Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. Tonight we've got an interesting one, one that I take a personal interest in. Um, if you've been following the site for any amount of time, you know that I'm rapidly aging. And for the past maybe two years, I've been looking um, for a lens that would, would you know, prevent me from having to move out of my habitual one-day lenses that I've been wearing for so long. And I'd experimented with a bunch of different multifocal lenses, and nothing really stuck with me. Either the vision wasn't what I wanted it to be, or it was less comfortable um, than my habitual lens. So lo and behold, earlier this spring, um, out came the AccuView uh, One Day Moist Multifocal. And I was able to try it right when it came out. Um, and much to my amazement, uh, this was the one that worked for me. So. Um, when I knew that we were going to be doing this webinar, I had a great interest in it um, since I'd experienced the product firsthand, which is something that I can't really say uh, about many of the webinars that we do. Um, and tonight it's going to be a very special show, too, because it's not going to be sort of a PowerPoint festival as, as um, presentations sometimes are. We really want this to be an interactive session. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to have three experts that are going to be working with us um, and hopefully fielding a bunch of your questions as well about this new lens, because I think they're probably as excited as I am about it. Um, because it really brings something to the market that, that wasn't there before. Um, so on tap for you tonight, we have Dr. Melissa Barnett, um, and she's the principal optometrist at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento, California. And she specializes in anterior segment disease and specialty contact lenses. Um, we also have on the line Dr. Mark Wells, and Dr. Wells is a partner uh, optometrist at the Cheyenne Vision Clinic, uh, which is a group practice uh, in Wyoming. And He's also faculty at the Vision Care Institute, so you may have heard him speak before as well. Um, and finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Kurt Moody. And Dr. Moody is the Director of Clinical New Product Development um, in R&D uh, for J&J &J Vision Care. Um, and under his leadership in R&D, he brought this lens to market. And you may have heard Dr. Moody's radio show that we did with him back in the spring when, when the lens came out. So um, he was one of the big drivers behind this lens, and it's great that he could make it out here with us tonight and, and talk about the lens as well. So speakers, thank you so much for being here tonight. And let me just advance the slides here just to let people know what we're going to be doing here. Um, so first and foremost, we're going to give you a little overview of the lens um, in very broad strokes. Then we're going to talk about an in-market assessment um, that J&J Vision Care did. And if you don't know what that is, this is basically the lens has been available now for several months. So they went out and they did some research to see how it's doing out in the field. Um, and this is sort of exciting because this is new research. So I think the results came in maybe a day or two ago. I know the PowerPoints were so fresh when we rehearsed this that we didn't even have the slide with the results. So this is brand new stuff that you're seeing for the first time tonight. Um, then we're going to move on and talk about the doctor's experience uh, with the lens. And finally, we're going to hit on the fitting guide and fitting tips uh, and best practices for working with the lens and, of course, field your questions. Um, as the webinar unfolds tonight, you'll notice on the right side of your screen there is a Q&A box. And let me actually make that nice and big for everyone, as big as, big as can be. Um, so the Q&A box is where you can type in questions and answers. And when you type in a question, it'll be sent to us so you don't have to uh, worry about everyone seeing it. It's just going to, to me uh, and, and the speakers. Um, and what we'll do is we'll hold your questions aside, and we'll answer them uh, at the end of the show tonight. Or um, if I see something germane you know, ba based on the topic that we're talking about, I might bring it up then as well. So feel free to use that question and answer box. Um, and we will go from there, I suppose. So there we go. So I guess why don't we kick things off um, I suppose, with Dr. Moody. So Dr. Moody, let's just start here. And can you tell us a little bit about the One Day AccuView Moist uh, Multifocal? Yeah, very ha happy to, Adam. i um, also like to really thank Dr. Burnett and Dr. Wells for joining us this evening to really kind of hit high on just what we've done with this really unique lens. So, you know, really our, uh, probably one of our newest innovations here from Johnson & Johnson. And uh, as you can see on the top, really calling out five unique aspects of the lens. Uh, first and foremost, you know, really in a class of its own. So we definitely went back to the drawing board on this particular product. Uh, the fact, you know, like I said, that I was very, very fortunate to lead the team that brought this lens out, you know, re reinforcing the fact that, you know, this is bring, being brought to you by an optometrist. So I think that insight 
hopefully is what's going to make the difference in, in the product performance. But calling out really three unique aspects of this particular lens. The very, very first is our pupil optimization. So we've done something very, very unique. Um, and even the U.S. Patent Office agreed with us that it was unique in the fact that we received our patent about a year ago on the premise of what we've done with this particular lens is that we've actually tailored the power distribution, the power profile of every single lens in your fitting set to match the natural variation that we know that occurs in the population in regards to pupil size. So as we age, our pupils become smaller, they become less responsive. Also, hyperopes, smaller pupils than our myopes. And you know, we were able to do that with a very, very well-controlled study that we conducted, 609 eyes, one of the largest pupil studies ever done. Uh, we controlled for accommodation, so we really made sure that, that we did the study appropriately, and that learning gave us the information that we needed to create this unique pupil optimization design. So we now have a design that's intended to give very, very consistent performance as your patients age and also across the refractive range, and that's something we knew was really lacking in the market. We also knew that you know, doing an aspheric design meant that we had to have a particular product that would center very, very well on the eye, and that's really what this hybrid design is. So we created a mechanical design that's aspheric in the center of the lens, so we preserve the optics on the front surface, and then spherical in the periphery to create a lens that centers about 50% better than any product that we've got in our current portfolio. Uh, the next aspect is the fact we put it on a very, very proven platform. So one day AccuView Moist Multifocal now is joining that family of products that we have. So that, that family is now you know, the number one selling daily disposable brand globally. And you now have a product that's available in a sphere, a toric, and now a multifocal, really addressing those unique needs of our presbyopic patient, that dryness and discomfort. And, and finally, the uh, the aspect that we worked on very, very hard was to make sure that we created a fit system that was easy to fit, that would end up you know, being very, very easy for our doctors to be able to use in their practice by virtue of the fact that it's very, very intuitive. So when we ramp all this together, we really feel we have a, a winner on our hands here. So you know, uh, Adam, you, you brought up the fact about our in-market assessment, and, and yeah, I think he did a great job in letting the audience know a little bit about an in-market assessment. So, you know, back in about March of this year was when we kicked this off. And the way we do our in-market assessments is we want to reach out to doctors and patients after the product is launched to really get a, a much, much better assessment of how the product is hitting those key points for our doctors and our patients. So in this particular assessment, we actually reached out to 234 eye care practitioners, or ECPs as we like to call them, uh, and reached out to almost 2,000 patients. Um, we did that in both the United States and the United Kingdom, and this was over a four-month period. And after a one-week duration, this is some of the really exciting news that we're hearing. And I think in the, the highlight that we really have here is that this particular product, you know, one-day AccuView Moist brand multifocal can definitely help drive practice growth. So, you know, I was in practice 22 years before I joined J&J, &J, and I know this is something that would be very, very meaningful to me when I was in practice. So driving patients into my practice, extremely important. And you could see what our patients came back and were telling us. Eight out of 10 patients said that they would recommend this particular product to a family member or a friend. Nine out of 10 of those patients said that they would recommend the, the doctor that fit them with this lens. And that's really important to us as doctors, is to get that patient coming in and saying, I'm going to bring my family and friends back to you. And then nine out of 10 patients said that they intended to return to that particular doctor next year. Again, that patient retention is huge. As far as the doctors, what were they telling us? So nine out of 10 of those doctors agreed that they felt one day AccuView Moist Multifocal would now become their lens of first choice when they were reaching for a multifocal contact lens. Three out of four of those doctors felt that it was probably the easiest multifocal 
to date that they had to fit. And nearly all of these docs, 99% actually, said that they would recommend one day AccuView Moist Multifocal to a friend or a colleague. So I think, you know, really, really great, robust data that's telling us, again, this is going to drive patients into the practice, and it's going to be something that people feel proud to be able to then refer to, uh, to their family and friends. So I think Great. next, I think we'd really like to hear a little bit from Dr. Barnett and Dr. Wells to see how much this in-market assessment data is kind of echoing what they've seen in their practices. Here yeah, is we're... Melissa Barnett, and I'd be happy to talk about it. This lens has been just amazing in my practice, um, something that I have never ever seen before is that when I sent some patients out who maybe I've refit uh, from the one day moist and fit into the one day multifocal and said, you know, you can either contact me or come back and see what, you know, what you think. I have patients more than any other lens I fit contact me saying, I don't want to come back. I love this lens. Everything is fantastic. Vision is great. Comfort is great. Let me order a year supply. And so right off the bat, this lens just sort of blew me away. Yeah, I would, I would uh, reiterate that and agree with that. We, you know, it, we're fortunate enough to be able to be involved in some of this test marketing. And, and uh, again, this is Dr. Wells. Um, and so what we did when we knew we were going to get the lens, we, we made a list of about 40 to 60 patients that we knew we wanted to try in the lens. And so we were able to put a lot of patients in the lens very, very early on. And, and with four of us in the office, we all sort of took a different niche of, of maybe who was going to tackle, you know, the, the new wares and who was going to tackle uh, former wares maybe. And I, I sort of targeted um, my one-day users already um, to sort of just see, you know, they were already in that modality. I knew that switching over wouldn't be, a, you know, a cost issue perhaps. Um, and then I also targeted a lot of the part-time users. and. And, uh, yeah, just overwhelming success from the very beginning and, and never really seen a lens that, that did draw so many uh, other referrals, patients just sending other patients our direction because they had a lens that they didn't feel they had to compromise. We all are used to um, sort of compromising in a multifocal, and I didn't feel like we had to do that at all with this lens. Right. And, uh, and, and Dr. Barnett, your, your practice is a primarily specialty contact lens practice. What sort of patients did you... Uh, try to try to put in this lens. Well, I actually have um, a very diverse patient population, which I do enjoy. So this was not for my irregular cornea patients. This was for you know my presbyopic patients, but that includes those early presbyopes. So patients in their late thirties, early forties, um, that are on the computer a lot, doing a lot of near tasks, which I feel like I'm saying every single day because we are all doing that in our society today. Um, but for really all patients, this lens has been pretty amazing. I like how Dr. Wells also mentioned the part-time users because that's a great patient population that we can offer this lens to. This lens is very easy to fit, which we'll get into in a moment. It's very straightforward as long as you follow the fitting guide. And for a part-time wearer, it's you know a great option as well as someone who wants to wear the lens every single day. Daily disposable lenses are my absolute favorite if I can get, you know, patients in this lens. But, but I found also um, to the point that Dr. Wells made, too, is that I have refit multiple patients from different designs and also new users. And high myopes, it's been amazing. So really a wide variety of patients. This lens has been very successful in my practice. Great. And, and so what, what's it really meant to you? You know, doc, Dr. Wells, you know, you mentioned that you, you, you picked a particular subset of patients to start. What has it meant to your practice to, to have this kind of a lens at your disposal now? Um, I think the biggest thing has been, been everybody was excited, you know, uh, and, and got on board early. And, you know, with four different doctors, we all know how optometrists are <laughs> difficult to change. And, you know, there's always going to be some skepticism, but everybody was on board. And so I think the first thing was, wow, all four of us agreed, really five of us, we have two locations, um, that were 
everybody was like, wow. It wasn't like, okay, two of us got on board and, and the other three were like, ah, I'm still having trouble. Everybody had great success. So the number of patients we put in and the number of referrals that were coming back was, was phenomenal. And we, uh, I don't have the numbers, but I think our multifocal um, use in general from our rep, you know, for this year has already gone up 20 or 25 percent. And, and, you know, we charge extra for a multifocal fit, so that, that helps as well, you know, from a, from a cash flow standpoint. Um, but just uh, just a lot of referrals and a lot of patients, as Dr. Barnett said, that, that are just happy and, and you know, there a lot of them were used to three and four and five visits with, with a multifocal and, and because of the ease to fit, um, just haven't had that problem. And so just I've never seen a lens add more referrals or get people excited um, as this lens has. So it's been, been pretty cool. Great. And I guess, should we address the elephant in the room right now, everyone? Um, <laughs> so if you are a members of ODWire, you've seen the discussions going on the site where people, some people will not use the fitting guide. They'll go, they'll go off the reservation and will just kind of do, do their own thing. Um, but, you know, fortunately tonight we have, uh, you know, one of the people who's responsible for the fitting guide. And, and I think Dr. Moody might just want to take us through the fitting guide and, and explain how it works and why it's a really good idea to stick to it. Yeah, definitely have to, happy to. Yeah, and it probably is one of the most frequently asked questions. You know, I mean, why, why should I use the, fit, the fitting guide? So, you know, early on, you know, in tonight's presentation, we talked about the unique patent that we have on this product, the fact that we've optimized that power profile. You know, we've got that unique distribution of the power in the lens to really target it towards what we know is that natural variation in the pupil size. So, you know, a lot of science, you know, a lot of hard work went into creating that unique design. So we have almost these tailor-made lenses for each of our individual patients. So I would say if you don't follow the fit guide, you're actually not taking advantage of that unique technology. But after most docs, I would say probably have used the fit guide for about 10 patients, what we consistently hear is, you know, it's really intuitive. If you really understand, and, and I think after this brief presentation, you will understand the optics a bit better and what we've done with this uh, center near continuous A sphere, it does make absolute optical sense it, 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 because it was based on the way we were all taught optometry during our first couple of years. So step one is, is what we all do every single day. You know, just do a very, very good, careful, subjective uh, refraction. Uh, the one thing we don't want to do is take a refraction from a year ago or six months ago. You don't want to take a refraction maybe from your associate. And by all means, you don't want to use a multifocal prescription from another brand because it's using a different technology. So do that good distance subjective refraction. Personally, I always make sure I do a binocular balance. So I'm really feeling very, very confident that you know, I'm not over minusing the patient at all, and I'm really hitting home on the right functional refraction for that particular patient. And Dr. Moody, the, this is, mm -hmm. it's Dr. Sure. Barnett here. If I could just add in how much I agree with you about getting a refraction. So especially in that early presbyope, even if you saw the patient six months ago, it is important to get a new refraction and really not over minusing, pushing plus, and in, in addition, I, I agree, I, I do like my own refraction too, so I, I always like to double check and just make sure because even a quarter diopter can make a difference. If you have just an excellent refraction, it's going to limit the number of lenses you're going to need to use. Great, great, great comment. So once you have that, that refraction, you, know, you want to make sure that you're not exceeding three quarters of a diopter or cylinder. You know, and, and the, the troublesome cylinder, you know, that we've got on all of our presbyops are those folks that have against the rule or oblique. You know, sometimes you might get away with a little bit more if it's with the rule, but against the rule and oblique, you've got to be a little careful there. So you want to make sure you do a spherical equivalent and then remember to, uh, to correct for your vertex power. If you're over a plus or minus four diopter, correct for that. So now you've got your starting point for your distance Rx. Next, we do ask you to determine uh, eye dominance. And you know that there, there's two ways that it can be done. There's a sighting method, 
which lots of folks are very familiar with, but also a sensory method. The sensory method is, you know, having the patient looking out in the distance with both eyes open, usually with their habitual correction. And I put a plus one lens in front of each eye individually. And the way I usually perform the test is asking them, you know, when the image that they're seeing out there is more, um, is more comfortable. And in that particular case, whatever eye I have the plus one lens in front of, that then is their non-dominant eye. The eye that they're looking through is their dominant eye. Sensory and sighting dominance match in about 85% of the cases, but in those 15% that it doesn't, I would tell you the sensory dominance is definitely more sensitive to any of these binocular systems. So, uh, Dr. Burnett, Dr. Dr. Wells, any comment on uh, eye dominance? Is this what typically um, you're doing also? Yeah, I, I just reiterate that. I think that's super important doing the sensory dominance um, test. I think the, the sighting method tends to vary more um, and I think because the fit guide follows that so so closely, um, yeah, I, I tend to leave them just behind the foropter. I plus up a, a buck and, you know, back and forth and ask them which is more bothersome. Um, so I tend to do it inside the foropter if I'm, you know, if I have plenty of time, I may pull it out and do a habitual or, or with a trial frame. But I tend to just do it in the foropter real quick plus one blur on each eye and find out which is more bothersome to determine that. But it works, you know, it takes 20 seconds and makes a huge difference in, in determining dominancy. Great. So and I agree uh, as well. Perfect. So that, that then our next step is to determine the add and really open to whatever system you use, whether it's a fused cross cylinder test, uh, a plus up test, you know, even in the age test. I mean, whatever you're comfortable doing, do ask that you make sure, again, that it's a functional uh, near ad. So really keeping in mind, you know, what that patient does, what their avocation is, what their vocation is, because that will definitely make sure that you're dialing in the right near vision requirements for your particular patient. So once you've got those three steps, you, you really have all the tools you need to, to go forward with this now. You know, you take a look at our initial lens selection and you should be able to pick out whether that patient should be in a low-low, a mid-mid, or a mid-high combination. So once you put those lenses on your patient's eyes, I ask you to, you know, give them a little chance to, to adapt to the, the lenses and have that visual assessment. You know, we're saying 10 minutes, but I'll be frank with you, there, there's nothing special about the 10 minutes. If your patient could come back and give you some really good feedback in five minutes, great. But you know, if you could definitely make it real world. And you know, I've had the opportunity to now, as we've been launching this product, I've literally probably traveled the world twice as we've launched it, visited you know, ev almost you know, every major contact lens prescribing country. And I can tell you that the common denominator is in every single country, the first thing every patient does is they pull out their cell phone and see if they could see their their text messages and their, their email. So that has become the, uh, the best probably near vision test we currently have. Um, but give them those 10 minutes or so just to, uh, to get used to the lenses. So again, uh, Dr. Wells, Dr. Burnett, any uh, of your comments up to this point? Um, I'd like to Sir, it, it's kind of Dr. Burnett, and, and I'm laughing here to myself at, because I today asked my patient to pull out her cell phone and look at it because I find that is just so real world. Um, in my practice, I send my patients outside of the exam room. We have a nice window that they can look out of. I have them look around the environment, pick up different things. If they have any work with them or a book, to look at that as well. And with this lens, I've actually found the reading vision uh, the near vision as well to be just very exceptional where it's very clear and crisp for the computer and reading distances which is just wonderful but I would definitely reiterate real world you know just keep it real it's much more important than the smell and chart for example I, I agree there and I'd like to reiterate about the the functional near vision because I, I see between be it interns at our office or, or docs that are fitting, fitting the lens maybe down at TVCI, um, I just feel like people really over plus at near. And, and, you know, nowadays with computers and cell phones and these digital things, I think things are back further in our world. And, 
And so I really make sure I go minimum plus at near, and I feel like that has been just more successful in not, you know, over plussing them, putting up them automatically into a mid mid. Um, and, and sacrificing perhaps distance vision, which I think so many doctors are afraid of with this lens, is that we're going to lose distance, which we just don't. Um, so I would reiterate that. And, yeah, giving them, giving them time to settle, it definitely makes a difference. Um, and, and, again, real-world stuff. I mean, that's what they're going to do. So very, very important to do that. Great, great, thanks. Great, great comments there. So, you know, when the patient comes back into the room, you know, you're going to ask them, you know, how's the lens? Tell me what you like. Tell me the things that you're able to do now that maybe you haven't been able to do in the past. Uh, so they'll give you some of that feedback. But if it comes down that, you know, we've got to maybe do a little bit of troubleshooting, the one thing I'd ask you to do before you even start to jump into the, the troubleshooting tables is let's first make sure that we've got the right carrier power on. So even though we did a great subjective refraction on step one, I tell you the one clinical pearl, and, and this I think is really true for almost every lens that's out there, is if you now do what we call a modified Humphreys over refraction, it gives you a great, great opportunity to see if you've got to tweak the carrier power at all. So again, I'll take us all back to first or second year optometry school. So that the way you do that modified Humphreys over refraction, again, is in free space. I usually put the 2025 or 2030 line out in the distance. And again, I'll take out my plus one trial lens. I'll, I'll usually put it in front of the left eye to begin with, and I'll tell the patients, you know, I'm going to put this lens in front of your one eye. It'll blur things a little bit, but, you know, what we're doing, as we all know, is we're fogging the patient, so to a, really to be able to control accommodation. And then in front of that right eye, I'm going to use my plus or minus flippers. So I'm probably going to show them a plus 50 to begin with, ask them, did they make it better or worse? Then I'll give them a plus a quarter, ask them did it make it better or worse, and then occasionally I will throw the minus a quarter in to see if it improves things at all. So obviously if they take more plus, we definitely want to give it to them. Um, and I'm always real sensitive about the minus. So adding minus to any of these aspheric systems usually doesn't give a big benefit, but if you notice that all of a sudden your patient picks up a line of vision, then, then of course you're going to give them that particular power. Then I'll flip it around and we'll do the same thing on the fellow eye. So by doing that modified Humphreys over refraction, it literally probably takes 10 to 20 seconds if that, you're really giving yourself that little bit of assurance that you do have the right carrier power. So once you... And, and Dr. Uh, Moody, if I, mm -hmm. if I could add in, I, I completely agree and I found with this lens, it's usually just a quarter diopter, for example, maybe a half of plus and rarely minus, but if it's minus, maybe it's minus a quarter. So it's a very, very small amount, typically. Yep, small changes really give us big, big changes here within this particular product. We, we see some big results That's there. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that if, if, you know, somebody thinks by just adding a plus a quarter, if they, if they feel like it's, it's better but they're not sold on it, Again, I think grabbing a new trial lens is so important because, again, a, a minus three is not a minus three twenty-five. It's it's not just a quarter difference in the in the in the nearsighted power, because of pupil optimization, and it's a totally different lens from a three to a three twenty-five. So I think it's really important to make that change in the office if you feel like you know it's needed before they leave the office. Yeah, those lo loose lenses will give you the right direction, but just as you're mentioning there, Dr. Wells, the, the actual lens on the eye is really going to be the, the, the true test for you. So, you know, we, I think at this point, you know, we feel we've got the right carrier power. If the patient now says, I need better distance vision, you know, they're, maybe they're happy with their intermediate and near, but if they say that they need better distance vision, you know, what are you going to do? So I, I just want to explain a little tiny bit of the optics of this, these aspheric lenses to understand why we make some suggestions. So, you know, the, the way all of these lenses work, on the level of the retina, we never have a finite focal point. We always, if we, again, we'll go back to first or second year optometry school, we've got uh, a blur circle or a circle of least confusion, and that's basically a retinal image spot size of, of where the image is. When you go from the low to the mid to the high, that retinal image size 
slightly increases. But as it's doing that, our depth of focus is getting longer because we needed a longer depth of focus to make up for the loss of accommodation from when we go from a low to a mid to a high. So keeping that in mind, if a patient needs better distance vision and we have them in a low-low combination, what we'd like you to do is to take the low ad out of the dominant eye and drop them down to one day AccuView moist uh, sphere. The purpose of doing that is the fact we're going to go from a blur circle of a specific size to a smaller blur circle. They'll therefore get better distance vision. If you add minus, when you already know you've got the right carrier power, all you're doing is you're robbing from the depth of focus, but you're not making the retinal image size any smaller. Same, same setup, when we're in the mid-mid, we're going to take them out of the mid in the dominant eye and drop them to the low ad. Again, smaller retinal image size, better distance vision. The only step in this whole fit guide that some people feel is a bit non-intuitive is when we have that patient in the mid-high combination. Now, what we're asking you to do is to go to the non-dominant eye, pull the high ad out, drop down to a mid-ad, but add plus a quarter. By doing this, this entire system that we've created here is really based on binocular summation. So when we have the mid-high combination on some people, they may be sensitive to the amount of disparity that's been created. And by going to the mid-mid with a plus a quarter in the, in the non-dominant eye, we've decreased the disparity in the distance. Therefore, we've improved the binocular summation and the patient should get better distance vision but we've preserved the near vision by adding the plus a quarter. So that's really, really key. Again, if you understand that those optics, all of a sudden the whole fit system makes a lot of sense. For our patients that need better near vision, one simple golden rule, just add plus a quarter diopter to that non-dominant eye in all the cases and you'll get better near acuity. So again, small changes, big results. But again, the whole system is based on binocular summation. So we always make sure we stay within that area of summation. If you create too much disparity, you actually go into inhibition and you see poor. So our whole system is based on always staying within that realm of, of summation. So I definitely want to pause there and, uh, and give Dr. Barnett and Dr. Wells an opportunity to kind of chime in on at this point also. It's Dr. Uh, Barnett I, here. So in, in a few patients that have required a toric lens um, in their dominant eye for improved vision, I have fit with a one-day moist for astigmatism in their dominant eye and with a variety of ad powers, even a mid-ad, with just great results with this lens. So it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, that's something that been helpful. I think yeah, I would just works. reiterate. Yeah, I, I I would just reiterate it using the guide. Um, you know, we all have such a such a preconceived notion as to how we should fit multifocals, and and you know, you guys did all the research and figured out how to fit this thing. And and when you do follow it, the success just goes so much easier. And and. I think another thing to point out is in, in other multifocals, we tend to be in a high and a high, you know, or a plus 250 in each eye, and, and there's nothing here that it's very, very rare. I probably on three to five pages at the most ever even tried a high and a high. I just don't get there. And so that's, why, again, why I think I feel like the distance vision stays so well with this lens. Um, I, I've rarely had a failure with this lens um, due to distance vision. And, and I think that's pretty exciting um, because we can always tweak it with a pair of cheaters or readers or whatever. But but I think in the past we've had failures due to distance correction or distance vision, and I just haven't had that. But but again, following the guide, it just it's a simple guide, and it makes so much sense, and it, it just makes our world so much easier. So so one of the things we sometimes hear is uh, beyond the guide. Are there any you know additional little fitting tips? And, uh, and, you know, and we definitely have a, a few here that we like to call out. 
and, and not that this deviates at all from the FIT guide, but again, these are some of the, I think, some of the tips that uh, end up making the uh, just a bit more successful. So the very first one is when you are doing that refraction. Um, so I'm a 1983 graduate, uh, you know, PCL, which is now Salus University. But when I graduated, we were taught to refract in, you know, in a dark room, you know, take that lamp and shine it on your back wall. Uh, definitely, you don't want to do that when we're refracting, especially for these multifocal patients. Our, our presbyops, you're best to refract them in ambient light. You know, by doing it in a dark environment, you're increasing the aberrations in the eye and you know, definitely going to give you an altered prescription. So ambient light is definitely the, the best uh, refraction media that you want to do here. We talked about really refining that distance refraction, make sure it's something that's a functional refraction. We've also found that that mid-add becomes your workhorse. I, I think you're going to find that you probably reach for that mid-add you know, probably more than anything else. Although it, I think this system, because again it's set up as a binocular pair, does give you the ability to do some proactive fitting. So some of those people who maybe are in their mid to late 30s, again, this becomes a product I think that you could start to proactively fit to address some of the, the near stress and strain that these folks that are spending you know, hours and hours and hours on tablets and phones and, and computers. Uh, so Dr. Burnett, Dr. Wells, um, are you finding that also that the mid adds the workhorse? Oh yeah, definitely. Then and, um, and I def I definitely agree as well. And just um, back to the fitting guide, you know, we might not from other lenses reach for that mid and high in the plus two to plus two fifty ad, but that I think might be the most common mistake that people make. And so just follow the fitting guide, basically, on the dominant eye, just choose the mid-add, the non-dominant, choose the high-add. Yeah, uh, the, the over-prescribing of the ad, you know, we've heard this for years and years, but amongst people who I've heard have had some issues, uh, the hyperopic patient who is complaining of seeing shadows in the distance, it's usually because we've over-prescribed the ad. You know, so if you've got a 48-year-old patient who you put into a mid and a high, uh, you know, the problem probably is because, you know, you've overprescribed that ad. So being very careful and judicious with that is definitely going to reward you. You know, we talked about the functional vision assessment, really making sure that it's, it's real world. And again, if you, I, I would tell you, if you leave with anything tonight, the modified Humphreys over refraction, if you start doing that tomorrow, I think you're going to really feel a lot more confidence as your patients are leaving the office with making sure we've got the right correction on their, on their eyes. Great. Okay. Well, I think, uh, you know, we're, it's, uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so I think what I'd like to do is, is sort of start talking about um, best practices um, and sort of additional advice that, that you can give listeners. Uh, about the lens, and I, I want to actually start with a, a question and a comment. Um, and the, the the comment is sometimes docs are afraid to you know approach patients about lenses like this because of cost. Um, so I guess my my big question, putting clinical issues aside, talk to me a little bit about the cost and what your experience has been with the patients that you you sit with the lens. And I guess uh, Dr. Barnett, do you want to start? Sure. So you know, of course, cost is always an issue, and that's something that we always talk about, although I think in our profession we're a little bit afraid and we have all these perceived notions about what a patient will value and what they won't value. But when presenting this lens, I like to keep it positive. You know, we have this great new technology. Let me tell you about the technology. And actually, if the patient is open, have them try on the lens. With this lens, I find even in the office, just walking around like we talked about, pulling out their phone, maybe looking at the computer, doing things that they normally do, patients are quite impressed. And with this lens, cost is not as much of a barrier as, say, with other lenses. I think the value of this lens really comes out that, one, you know, it's a daily replacement lens. It has great technology. It works well at all distances. Patients are very comfortable. It's something that they value and they think is important. So. I've been pleasantly surprised 
with the cost issue as far as this lens, and I'd love to hear what Dr. Wells has to say as well. You know, I think one one reason I started with those one day users already that were either in mono or in, in using readers was again it was an easier transition and so it, in in my own mind it was easier and I didn't have to to you know swallow that that sale of a thousand dollars whatever we're I mean I I can tell you our fees are very high and as far as what we sell our products for and so. Um, but I think, as you mentioned, the technology, I, I tell patients, this is the most technologically advanced lens that's ever been developed. So we're going to have to pay for that. Um, but I, I don't have a, a really good heart-to-heart -heart discussion on cost with my patient in the exam room. I, I said, let's get it on you. Let's try it. Let's see you back in five to seven days. Um, you know, and we'll see how it works. The staff can talk to you about it. And I know a lot of doctors are, are skeptical and think, well, that just doesn't work, but it does. And, and there's going to be some cost issues. I mean, I've had it. it it's going to happen. But um, the, the success of the lens just breeds confidence in the patient. And, and we've all used the cup of coffee thing. And, and honestly, nowadays, you know, 30 years ago, a cup of coffee was a quarter. But honestly, people spend 3 and $4 a day on a cup of coffee. And, it, and it's less than that. And I, I've used that. Um, and so, you know, I, I just think, I just don't really address it a lot. Um, I just get it on the, the patient. The success seems to breed in them, and, and it doesn't become as big an issue as we thought it would be. Right. I, I think I'd like to, I'd like to agree. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say this from the patient's perspective. I'll take, since, since I am one, <laughs> um, the thing that really sold me on the lens was after I got my trials, obviously there were, no, there were none in stock. This was when the lens first came out. And I ran through all of them. You know, when I put my single vision lens back in, after I ran out, it was a no-brainer. I, I was going to order this lens. The price didn't even really occur to me because the vision was so much better um, that I almost felt like I couldn't live with the single vision lens. And I'm not sure if, if your patients have had that experience, too, where when they're living with the trials for a while, it, it sort of sells itself after, after a bit. Yep, yep. Most definitely. And I agree with Dr. Wells. I hand it off to my staff to go over the cost. And, you know, it, I think it, it does work very well in my practice as well. Okay. And so I guess, you know, we're, we're coming down to the wire here. So I think what we want to do is open it up to questions from the audience. So um, if everyone, you can see the Q&A box on the right. If you've got some questions, feel free to, to fire away. Um, we got a few in, in here already that I'd like to ask, um, uh, covering a wide range of topics. Why don't we go back to the clinical side of things? Um, what do you do with emetropes? And uh, whoever wants to take it, feel free. So you know, we, we, we've had some great, great experience with with emetropes, Adam, and and we noticed this really early on because there's a number of products that are out on the market, and if you read their fit guide, they actually tell you to uh, try to stay away from the emetropes. So I guess you could say we saw that as a little bit of a challenge. And we actually just finished a clinical study that we are going to be showing the results at the Global Contact Lens Specialty Symposium out in Vegas in, in January. And in, that, in this particular study, we actually recruited patients from uh, Pensacola, Florida, and London. We, our sample size that we ended up with was about 80 patients, and we followed them for a month. And they're all functional emetropes uh, across all the different ads. And we ended up, in that particular study, we ended up, I think, with 76% success. So, you know, when we looked at the, the normal cohort, we were getting uh, about 90, 94% success with two pair of lenses or less. So in this cohort, you know, we were, you know, 74, 75%. Uh, and again, I think that's pretty high success for a really tough group of patients. Uh, but I do hear f from a lot of docs out there who are really successful with this lens that those functional emetropes are really what's driving all those new incremental patients into their office. They're getting great success. They're kind of feeding after one another. So um, I think, Dr. Burnett, I think when we were talking about this the other day, I think you were saying something very similar. Yes, I agree. Um, and again, I would... I feel like I'm saying this over and over, but just not to overplus the ad. So in these emetropes, you know, you can use a low ad. You can, you know, talk about their work environment, see how long their arms are, see where they actually function. 
but the low ad has been working great. Of course, um, uh, those study results are just very exciting. Um, but you you might need a mid ad, and I just would not over plus if possible the the ad. So you know it's been it's been a wonderful lens for for all 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 patients. I was actually reviewing some patients today that I fit in the lens, and it ranges from your early presbyopic hyperope, your low hyperope to the moderate hyperope to the really high myope who's a full presbyope and it goes and emetrope, you know, goes over all these different patients. And, you know, reviewing and I agree with Dr. Wells, it's very, very rare that you're using the high, you're using the mid ad really, really commonly and at least in my patient population. But for those of you who have not tried the lens, I'd encourage you to try it and get it in your own hands. It's been fantastic. I definitely don't and shy question away from here. Go ahead, Adam. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just saying I don't. I definitely don't shy away from the imitropes. Those, those are the ones that are that are more frustrated by anything. They've had great vision, and now they got to dig for these reading glasses all the time. And so it's it's actually been a a very good positive finding for them to have the freedom of not having to reach for those all the time. Right. How do hey, interesting the question. One, if I could just, yep. one other point that I found works really great and it really leverages the fact that we, this is a daily disposable. Some of the people I fit here you know, at, uh, at Johnson & Johnson that have been emetropes, you know, they do great with the lenses in the office, you know, intermediate and near, they absolutely love it. But if they do have any issues with the distance, uh, you know, the one little clinical pearl that works really good is I tell them, you know, right before you get in the car to drive home, reach to that dominant eye and take that, that that lens out, throw it away. You know, it's a disposable lens, and I can tell you how much better than they feel driving home and having just one lens in the eye for the remainder of the night works absolutely perfect for them. So really leverages the daily disposability of the particular product. And, and the thing that's really surprising is how comfortable they tell me. They, sometimes they even forget that they still have the lens in the non-dominant eye. So... Um, overall, you know, just a little clinical pearl that might work really well with people. Hmm. Great. Um, question here. So uh, myopes versus hyperopes or no difference, uh, you know, do you see any difference when, when you're fitting them? Is, there, is it more challenging one or the other with this lens? Uh, I have not seen that, to be honest. Um, I think because our success early on really was just you know, we were just wanting to get on patients, and we used every kind of refractive error. Um, so I, I would say I, I just don't pay attention to that anymore like I used to with most of our multifocals. So I, I can't specifically say, oh, I had trouble with the plus twos, um, you know, versus the minus folks. But um, so I, I have not seen that. And, and I agree. Really and that's been really successful over all refractive errors. So that really is the premise of that pupil optimization that, you know, we really now have a product that should provide exactly what we're talking about here, consistency across the refractive range, because now you've got a distance to near ratio that should be very, very consistent across the different ads and across the different refractive range. Yep. Great. Um, got a, a design question here, and I, I bet Dr. Moody you could probably answer this. Why are multifocal intraocular lenses designed with center far design, but the uh, AccuView multifocal designed with the center near design? Well, you know, uh, a lot of the, the, the IOLs now, most of the IOLs are, are using diffractive optics in regards to refractive optics. Um, and, uh, you know, diffractive optics, when you're creating that in an IOL, definitely are a lot more controllable. You know, you, you're manufacturing just one IOL versus thousands of lenses. Um, but, you know, even most of those lenses continue still to be a design that's a center near design. Every so often you will see a center distance, but if you're then looking at that in a diffractive versus a refractive, you're splitting the light in a completely different way that will become much, much less pupil dependent. Right. Um. Interesting question here. Uh, what are the realistic expectations for patients to have with the lens in terms of things like night driving, 
reading very small text and, and so forth. You know, how do you set those expectations and what should they really be? Um, Dr. Like Burnett here. So you want to go, go ahead? ahead? No, go ahead. Oh, just like, you know, like any multifocal and with presbyopes, you know, explaining lighting and how important lighting is and also contrast, you know, I feel like I'm constantly talking to my patients about contrast, especially those that read newspapers, and just talking to them about, you know, looking at the medicine bottle in a dimly lit room or reading a restaurant menu. You know, these are just realistic things that are going to come up. And to explain to them, if you need, you know, to have a pair of plus one readers for looking at a medicine bottle once a week, that's completely fine. You know, this is not your day-to-day, -day, and most patients feel much better that I say it's fine to actually pull that out just for that one specific instant for one minute. It's not a problem. Um, but for their day-to-day -day life, work, life, pleasure, everything, activities, you know, this lens is just fantastic. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up about the, using the readers because I – I don't shy away from that. I tell patients we may still need to use this. I, I kind of come up with sort of a contract with them, and I say, what do you, what do you hope to gain out of going to a multifocal contact? What, what would your world, what, what would be perfect in your world if we could, you know, visually uh, accomplish that? And so I find out really what they really want out of it and what their goals are. And if we get them to that, you know, and and, and they still have complaints, I remind them that hey, this is, you know, this is kind of what we talked about, and we're there. Um, and so, you know, again, not be afraid to use to use readers occasionally. Um, there's going to be some roadblocks along the way, but we'll try to get you to your journey of, of where we want to get, where we want to be to. Um, but it may take a few tweaks and some adjustments, and and we may have to use glasses for other things, and that's that's part of it. And I think that will breed success too if you are not afraid to share and, and talk about those issues. Right. And one thing, it's Dr. Barnett here, that I think I just have to say, you know, talking about any multifocal lens is the importance of treating the ocular surface. So, of course, we want the best results with this lens, and it's completely important to treat the dry eye, treat the blepharitis, treat the mycomitis, treat the GPC, and that's going to really lead you to the best outcome. And you know, I know some of us years ago would say, oh, we have this great technology, let's put it on the eye. But if we have an eye that is completely dry, we can try any multifocal lens, and it's really not going to be the best result until we treat the ocular surface. So I found um, just, you know, in everything I do, treating the ocular surface has been really successful to success in a lens, and that might mean that I'm not fitting the contact lens that day as well. You know, I'm seeing the patient back, and once they have an improved ocular surface, fitting them, and with multifocal lenses, that's especially important. Right. One, one final uh, product-specific question. The lens itself is, is a moist lens. Um, how does it compare to the single vision lens, just in terms of, of the way of the comfort and sort of the way it handles? What's, what's your experience been? What have patients told you? Go ahead. Anybody want to? Right. Uh, so, uh, so I can give you some some of the, the info is from a design aspect. You know the center center thickness of the lens, the um, the sag of the lens. You know very very similar to our moist lens. So the expectation is from a handling perspective, it should be very similar to the single vision moist product. From a comfort aspect, I would tell you that anecdotally, I continue to hear from patients that. The design seems to be a bit more comfortable, and my belief is it's because of the asphericity that we've placed on the back of the lens. We're distributing the, uh, the stress across the ocular tissue much, much more evenly, which I think is really resulting in a lens that's incredibly comfortable. Uh, but I really left this up to the, the two practicing clinicians to add a bit more. Well, with my patients, they think both lenses are quite comfortable. so. They haven't said that anything's different, you know, and I have refit patients from the moist to the multifocal and get them pretty happy. 
Yeah, I, I mean, the, the one-day moist material just works so well, especially in my climate, um, being very dry and windy. and So just have had no issues there. I, I was kind of pleased that it was in the one-day moist material, actually. So um, just really no issues there. Great. <laughs> And we'll end with, you know, if someone asks, are the speakers wearing this lens? I can tell you that I am, and I have been uh, for the last six months or so. Um, how about you guys? I, I wear it in my non-dominant eye, and in my dominant eye, I wear moist for astigmatism. I'm one of those folks that have got a diopter and half of astigmatism in my dominant eye. So the point Dr. Barnett was bringing up before is I'm your case in point, so it does work. And unfortunately, I have way too much astigmatism, so not yet. Maybe one day. I think, yeah, I think I see. It. I, I think I'm, I have a, a vision and an idea for a new product, guys. So yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it's in the lab. Uh, uh, I guess they want to ask us what our ages are, but no, I, I'm a, I'm post LASIK, and I've I've actually worn it, um, and I and I wear it off and on, not all the time. Um, my distance vision is so good, and I'm quite flat centrally. Um, and I can wear, my near vision is actually very good. Um, and I haven't experimented yet with a mono vision with just a bifocal in the one eye. Um, but I think my distance is so very good that when I do wear it, I feel like my distance is down some. Um, so I tend to, to, to wear it just occasionally, and, and, but it's done well. Um, it's comfortable, and I can definitely do well with it. But had I been not post-LASIK, I think it would be a tremendous lens. Sure. And I can just tell you from my perspective, wearing it for the last six months, you know, every, every day for 18 hours a day, um, it's, you, you don't notice it. That's the one thing that I notice about the lens, at least for me, at distance, I wear it low at. At distance, I don't really notice that the lens is any different, to, to be honest with you, than the regular moist lens. And it's just sort of the magic when you're sitting at the computer that, that really makes the difference. Um, and it, it makes it very difficult to go back to a regular single, single vision lens. And so with that, I think uh, it looks like we're, we're just about out of time. So, so thanks again for everyone for, uh, for attending. Um, the, oh boy, now we have the, the big legal jargon up on the screen for everyone to look at. You, you can't leave till you look at it. Um, so thanks for everyone for coming out. Um, we uh, will be having uh, this, our archive of this video will be up on ODWire uh, very soon. And you can rewatch the presentation there. Um, and there'll be a discussion thread about the uh, product as well right beneath the webinar when we post it. So if you have any more questions, feel free to, to come on the site, and I guess we'll continue the conversation online. So thanks again to our speakers, and thanks again to, for uh, everyone who attended, and uh, I guess I'll see you all online. Thank you. Thank you. Got them.